When you speak just once, you always have to ask yourself the question, what do you really want to say to the people? Or what would God have me select as a topic that would be important for you? You know, we have the privilege as traveling people to be able to repeat ourselves. Pastors don't often have that privilege. They have to be so fresh week after week, and it's a very challenging call. Uh, but I want to bring to you today a message that I think will be meaningful for you because it answers one of the most fundamental questions of life. Uh, life is punctuated by questions. The moment you begin to use language, the word why, what, how, when, all these questions come up very, very quickly in your mind and mine. So the subject that I want to address for you this morning is entitled, Who Are You, God? Who is God? I'll never forget, years ago, speaking at the Lenin Military Academy in Moscow, and all but one person in the audience were atheists. They were all atheists, except one guy who came to me afterwards and told me he'd been praying for years that somebody would come and share the gospel in that setting. And through my talk, one other officer kept going like this the whole time, giving me the choke sign. But I kept going. I just looked in a different direction uh, because sitting next to me was the general who'd invited me. But as soon as I finished my talk, this guy with the choke sign bounced to his feet. And here's what he said. He said, God. What do you mean God? You've been talking about God for 45 minutes. What are you talking about? I have no idea. So whenever you get jolted with a question, you have to quickly pray. So I said to him, are you an atheist? He said, yes. I said, what are you denying? If you say you're an atheist, A is the negative in Greek, theos for God, negative God. You say you're an atheist. What are you denying? You're asking me who God is, but you're telling me you deny God. So what is the God you're denying? He was stumped and didn't know how to backtrack and respond. So I gave him about a two or three line answer from God being the creator and the designer of the universe to the one who's made us in his image and that our hearts are ultimately restless until they find their rest in him. I want to read for you a prayer this morning from Second Chronicles 20 where there are questions asked about God, implicit in which are the answers themselves. So Second Chronicles 20, reading from verse 6, Jehoshaphat is surrounded by a massive army, and he doesn't know how he's going to deal with this. Invariably, when you're attacked by a massive army, you really go immediately to prayer. I remember talking to one of your generals, Isleta, years ago during the revolution and he and 800 of his men were at were at edsa and all of a sudden he said we opened to the book of psalms and we're reading from psalm 91 crying out to god dwelling in the shadow of the almighty napoleon when he surrounded moscow and the spires of moscow were burning the czar who had had no time for god goes to church and falls on his face before god crying out in prayer, and God answered his prayer by sending a minor, minor prophet the winter. And that took care of the rest of the battle as Napoleon's army couldn't withstand the severities of the winter. So here's Jehoshaphat, surrounded by the armies that he didn't know he could handle. Notice the three questions he asked. This prayer has both passion of heart and intelligence of mind. It retains theological integrity while blending it with deliberate passion and desire for God to intervene. The first part of the chapter describes the armies coming and surrounding him. In verse 6, he says this, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand, and no one can withstand you. O oh, our God, 
did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? First question he asks, are you not? Verse 7, second question he asks, did you not? In verse 12, he comes up with this, O oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. And in these three questions, are you not, did you not, and will you not, you see the answers that he ultimately gets. In 1952, Encyclopedia Britannica published one of its most popular series ever. It was called The Great Books of the Western World. Uh, it's about 53 volumes uh, of compilation. And I remember as a young student studying, young, actually uh, more of a professor in New York at that time, walking past the bookstores and wishing so much I could buy that series. But I kept waiting and waiting till it went on sale, and one day it did. And today it sits at the top shelf of one of my sections there, the great books of the Western world. 53 volumes. The first two volumes are entitled Syntopicon. It combines two words, the synthesis of topics. What does it mean? The way the books are distributed, the first two uh, volumes deal with themes, great themes, history, philosophy, law, ethics, God, in the first two volumes. Then in the remaining 51 volumes, those very themes are covered by the great writers of the Western world. So if you read the essay on law, and you want to know what Augustine said about law, you'll turn to the 18th volume on Augustine and see his section on law. Great themes covered as topics, great writers, and how they covered them. The chief editor is a man by the name of Mortimer Adler, one of the brightest minds in America, a latecomer to Christ, Jewish scholar, a latecomer to Jesus Christ. And Mortimer Adler years ago was being interviewed by Larry King on CNN. And Larry King looked at him and said, Sir Adler, I was looking at the themes of the great books of the Western world, and the longest essay is on God. You've covered great themes, but the longest essay is on God. Can you explain that? Mortimer Adler just shrugged his shoulders and said, Larry, because more consequences for your life follow from that one issue than any other issue you can think of. More consequences for your life follow from what you believe or disbelieve about God. And that's absolutely right. You are here today and cannot deny that statement. Your belief or disbelief in God defines everything else you do. If you believe and trust in God, your language, your giving, your behavior, your ethics, you may not always live consistently with it, but your guilt or fulfillment comes on how you think about God. I believe it was the famed C.S. 